Hello, everybody. Great to be back again. Uh, I'm Rajiv, managing partner at Orias, an early stage VC fund with more than 100 startups and multiple unicorns. Um, today is a very exciting conversation with Chris. Over the past few weeks, amidst, uh, amidst a sea of volatility in traditional asset classes and markets falling owing to the banking crisis led by SVB, one asset class has, hold, has been holding steady and has been building up. Uh, and that asset class, of course, you know what I'm talking about, which is Bitcoin uh, and, and, and generally the crypto asset class. It's, Bitcoin has quietly moved up to the 28,000 levels from 16,000, almost a 75% growth. <clears throat> and um, to talk about this asset class and what's happening there, we've invited Chris here today. So um, uh, Chris is the co-founder of Hyperion Decimus, uh, a digital asset management firm where he's the portfolio manager of the quant-driven multi-strategy digital asset fund with an experience spanning across risk management, portfolio construction, equity, futures, and derivative trading. Chris is an expert guru at analyzing the quality of uh, investments, both in the traditional finance space where he was, and now, of course, uh, in the crypto space as well. He's been in the securities industry since 2007 and has previously worked as a private wealth manager with Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch. Today, we'll discuss about hedge funds, <clears throat> digital assets, and Web3. We dive into what's happening in this ecosystem and why Bitcoin is gaining the value it is and what is the future. A um, couple of things that are very interesting about Chris. Chris has been into music and surfing, both of which got him excited about harmonics, right? And um, and that's where, where things like Fibonacci, CDs, and other things have sort of you know or, you know come into uh, you know his uh, his mind or his life, which of course have direct usage in things like technicals and trading. So Chris, we should talk a little bit about that as well. I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm going to sort of, um, you know, what I'm going to do today is do, um, you know, a Q&A session with Chris. I'm going to ask uh, Chris a series of questions. And then, um, you know, Chris will, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, give us uh, his take on it. And uh, Chris, uh, please be as elaborate as you want to be. And um, um, as I, as always, guys, um, if you have any questions, please put that up in the chat. We'll make sure that we'll bring it to the table and request, uh, you know, Chris to answer them. And I look forward to a productive 60 minutes. In the meantime, Chris, if there's anything else I need to add on uh, the introduction so far, please let me know. No, thank you. That was more than I deserve, probably. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Humility is one more virtue that I think I'm going to add to you. So, yeah. okay. So <clears throat> let's get started uh, with our thought process at this moment. So first of all, Web3. We were, um, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, this entire notion of Web3 as being decentralized, no, you know, trust authority figures in the middle, et cetera, et cetera, right? But can you sort of help us understand in your opinion, you know, obviously you got into this <clears throat> from a Web3 perspective, what is the ethos of Web3? What is in your mind, the big overarching, you know, uh, you know, message there? What is the vision of the Web3 world that I think, uh, that you think is going to sort of, you know, change the world as we know it? So it, it it's really kind of bifurcated into two core ethos, in my opinion. First, it's because the movement and iteration is based in cryptography, you've mm -hmm. got that decentralization element of it, right? And then perhaps more importantly to that, but this enables what I'm about to say is freedom of choice. You know, web, web one was disrupting essentially analog and web two uh, became oligarchy where in order for me to use a search engine, I have to accept cookies and they get my metadata and we are the actual product in web two. We are not choosing a product and service for our own free will. So the major distinction to me is, is along those two, two lines. Got it. Got it. Okay. So um, those are the two angles. Great. So one of the interesting things, and uh, it's a corollary to this question per se, uh, Chris, is really that uh, it, it's almost like the world is, seems to have taken a sight to this uh, asset class in the recent past, right? Uh, FTX obviously fell on its own, but after that signature bank, the regulatory woes in Coinbase, Binance, what exactly is happening in this in this world? Why do you think the traditional world is so anti-crypto? And could it be because obviously the ethos of crypto is basically, um, you know, jettison all the trust figures, basically all the authorities are now going to become non-authorities per se. Is that what um, is sort of causing this antipathy here? What is your thought process on this? Oh my, <laughs> you, you got nine hours. <laughs> so I, I like, and, and, and please to the audience, like, I'm here to provide clarity information to give you guys peace of mind and something actionable. Do not be bashful, interrupt, ask any questions real time. Um, but to unpack the first piece of that, I think we need to identify and separate what is fraudulent, what is 
investor and uh, company operator error, and then what is, for lack of a better word, the the hegemony of power globally, right? It includes regulatory authorities. It includes the the fascist link between corporations and governments, and everybody who basically controls all the wealth on the planet, right? Through those means. So I think looking at any new asset class or new product or service, you always get both passionate entrepreneurs and speculators and shysters on the first cycle. So having something like a Celsius or a Luna or FTX is typical of an emerging asset class space product or service. Um, FTX is very, very different than Celsius, which made maybe ethical, best practice errors, poor investment decisions was not transparent, whereas F FTX was absolute fraud and collusion at the highest levels of everything. So I don't think anyone should correlate that to the quality of a blockchain or its use case or its price, for example. So I, I really you know, make an effort to make a distinction there. And then to the the attack, funny, the regulatory attack and, and the choke point 2.0 and all, all of this stuff comes after all of the things that regulations are supposed to prevent in the first place. Now, we all as investors know that's how it works. Regulation doesn't prevent anything. It's a joke and pathetic. Uh, one of my partners happens to be one of the most prominent whistleblowers for the SEC over the last 20 years. Um, they pick and choose what laws they want to enforce and, and usually it's by precedent. So you know, as an investor, I don't look for them to protect me ever. So here, the problem is that the entire global banking system is insolvent on paper. Everyone's realizing it. Um, there's a shortage of euro dollar deposits. And you had two events that are, are you know, overlords could not calculate because they're incompetent. How long of running negative rates or zero real rates does that destroy price discovery and augment the economy? And how fast can we jam rates to attempt to fight inflation um, to stop it? So you have two things that have never occurred in history, the duration of zero, and then the speed and rate of change with which rates have risen. So obviously, that's going to present problems on an already strained system. For, for example, Rajiv, I, I can't believe human beings, collective consciousness participates in this system so, for so long. We have to constantly bail out the airlines and the pharmaceutical companies, the banks, and pay for wars and God knows where, proxy this and that, set price of commodities. This is not a system that works. It's on training wheels at best. And then these, the losses are socialized across the planet while I've been alive. I'm 40 years old. So to me, it's it's why would anybody opt into that? Why, why don't we opt out and do something more productive, creative, innovative, Oh, and by the way, saves a unbelievable ton of money. Just remittance payments, 152.4 trillion in 2022, B2B at 6%. So you're saying all of this is actually against the ethos of the traditional asset class, and that's the reason why they are fighting it hook, line, and sinker. Is that what it is? Uh, <clears throat> yes, and, and even the word traditional, or mm -hmm. let's call it, Stocks and bonds is, you know, th they're not stocks and bonds anymore, right? When I was taught by my grandfather about the allure and romanticism of, of buying into a company and, and owning future claim on future earnings, and oh, if I invest more, they can hire more people, and then they do well, I get a dividend. That that has been lost through through many many different ways: concentration um, to mega 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 you know trillion market cap companies. Um, the, la the lack of actual competitive practices where a lot of good technologies get purchased before they even come out and the ones that purchase them just shelve them. And then you, you've got these passive products that are jamming everybody into the same stuff and you don't even know what's going on. So the price action of the individual security has nothing to do with its success or, or lack thereof. And I could go on and on about that, but the traditional system isn't even traditional anymore. It's worse than a house of cards. All right. Uh, Netflix is clearly, <laughs> you know, uh, prevalent in our lexicon and analogy, and we'll get into that a little bit. So, I mean, let's segue into this question of regulation, right? Uh, so, Chris, you know, <clears throat> lots of countries, including our own, India, 
the prevalent argument against the uh, you know the the empire strikes back analogy here <laughs> is really that if you let go of um, you know this innovation and um, you know what's happening here then you're poorer in the innovation front as a nation right you know that's something that uh, has sort of been the card that most of the industry has played for a while right you know you don't want uh, yourself to be back data on cyber security because this is uh, clearly crypto security is clearly one of those and that kind of thing as well <clears throat> the question though is if the world goes that way if america you know obviously everybody is looking up to the us you know which is where you're sitting you know uh, for leadership in this and us is sort of saying hey <laughs> let's sort of train our um, you know gatlings at um, at uh, at this asset class right now then uh, europeans are also sort of not all that uh, excited about it doesn't that sort of you know put this um, you know this 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 entire regulation thing into a much stronger uh, place and isn't there the risk that this asset class might actually you know sort of end up sort of getting decimated I, I tend not to speak in absolutes because um, only a foolish person does that. But with respect to Bitcoin, it cannot be decimated. It just can't. So that's not possible. What, whatever its price is and whatever paired fiat is immaterial. But um, you know, make make no mistake. This is the greatest technology mankind has ever seen. It's been a, there's been hack attempts constantly for over a decade it's unbroken un, uh, the completely decentralized and we really should use that as a springboard to more freedom and innovation to create more products and services and companies and create more wealth through having you know small business make a huge comeback globally by innovating out of what the traditional apparatus has provided mm -hmm. us the last two decades mm -hmm. uh, all of which saves capital and it gives a better result um so I, I would say that, you know, what's going on with the loss of hegemony for the dollar and the BRICS, is, as I'm sure you know, I think is very positive. Uh, number one, because the U.S. has the most incompetent leadership ever the last 10 years. So we don't deserve it, haven't earned it, but also so that people can wake up and go, I've got more choice. And if, if you realize you can choose to do business with whoever you want in a manner, you know, and transact in a manner that. You know, both parties agree upon who is the government who are the regulators to tell you, you can and can't do that i mean that's the simple premise here right um so in my opinion it's it's a sad story to see the the west come after what is a wealth building sector mm -hmm. um and everybody in the sector are good people you know save mm -hmm. the uh, sam bankman free types and you know whether it's we come stay at your house or it's you know, Switzerland or it's Brazil, there will always be a home for freedom. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. for my case, like it's, you know, America's lost, lost its edge. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the future of regulation. I, I also buy the argument that it's going to continue. It's a sexy technology. You don't want to let go of it. <clears throat> Two questions here. One is there is this dichotomy that exists in the, <clears throat> the crypto world, right? So on the one hand, because it's a distributed ledger, because of the fact that all um, transactions are public knowledge because of that, mm -hmm. you know, the assumption that you make is all data is available to everybody else, right? On the other hand, thanks to FTX or any of these guys that are happening right now, it also turns out to be amongst the most incredibly opaque ecosystems where it's impossible to figure out who's doing what, right? So there almost seems to be a dichotomy here, right? You know, so on the one hand, the promise is a full transparency. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the reality is a full opacity, right? You know, so how do you how do you resolve this question, perhaps in in some sense? And perhaps is this the direction that regulation is heading towards? You know, where do you think the next six months or one year are going to take? You know, in terms of where the regulation is going to go? Obviously, assuming that uh, we want this to flourish and grow. Yeah, it's it's hard to speculate on their their ultimate, you know, endpoint, right? Or 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 even what are their goals? Because right now the goals is to destroy the whole thing, right? That that's their goal. Um, and to release CBDCs on the planet and control everybody's carbon and this, that, and the other. So to me, it's it's kind of binary. E either that happens and they win and, you know, it is what it is, or this actually holds, stands on its own two feet and via merit alone and the lack of participants um, giving up, which I, I think has already occurred, it, it'll find a way. Um, you know, the the fact that this is so profitable in in savings with how you don't have to go through six middle men and women to get a a title you don't have to pay 
$150 to send a wire transfer of your own money. You know, all of those things added up is GDP that could be spent elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in my opinion, I think regardless of the means and methods that they do short term, uh, their their end game is clearly to me to, to stop its progression at, at minimum, to destroy it at maximum. Um, and, it, and it's up to the greater public whether or not that's the case, because allegedly the these regulators work for us, the public constituents, but that's honestly never been the case. So noting noting that we know that, what what we don't know is is what if there's an upside surprise? Not not in price, but what if there's a a country that goes against this? And and even Germany showed signs of that yesterday with what they pass as far as trying to outline common rules and regs, and then. In June, it's going to be fully legalized in Hong Kong again. So there, there's going to be maybe a counterbalance to it. Um, I'm all about the you know, the market decides. So if this product or service does not fill a need, reduce cost, and make experiences better, then it it doesn't deserve to exist. And we've had too long of an economy where a lot of stuff in a lot of sectors has been less than that. And um, and do you have an opinion on the? Uh, transparency versus opacity um, argument. Oh, of course. Now. Yeah. So the chains are transparent. So if you, the easy, easy resource for everybody, go to EtherScan. Um, just put in Google and you can see all kinds of statistics real time. There are a lot of ways to look at what, what are called mempools, which are the blockchains themselves block confirmations. It's just, it's not on media to where oh this is how i go look at this live right so there's a little bit of you know preventing the common investor from being aware of how to do it right like for, for example how do you see uh, a 10k from a company you've got to go to their site or if you have a bloomberg terminal or reuter you, you know you, it's not just yeah. readily available so in that vein you do have to search out what co what coin do i want to look at and what site aggregates that data live um, and then you can follow wallets. Like, you know, we 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 knew to for our fund had no assets with FTX ever. We we knew to avoid that because we knew what wallets to watch. Got it. Got it. Got it. Excellent. And you've made some amazing trades. Um, to those of you um, on, on this call, please do check out um, you know Chris's uh, My Life in Four Trades on Real Vision. Um, it, it's going to be a fascinating. I mean, it'll also tell you how much money this bloke has made. He's uh, he's clearly a rock star that's sitting here on the table here. So uh, good stuff. So uh, let me let me. So obviously, moving on to more positive sides of the fence mm -hmm. right now, Chris. So. Uh, let's look at what is happening in the marketplace. Obviously, sixteen to twenty-eight thousand dollars. Right? What what is it that's sort of pushing this uh, uh, this this move upwards right now? And uh, what do you think is uh, what are the signals that you're watching that um, you know that makes you believe that this asset class will prevail? You spoke about you know how resilient it has been in the face of so much of opposition and so on. Can you sort of give us a little bit more of a detail here on what yeah, the sure. what the positive you know news on this entire space is? I think in, in general, as investors, when you see price movement, most just default to asking, why did this happen, right? That That's not the right question, in my opinion. And as a quant, it's you'd be objective and you weigh the evidence, right? And if you're doing that, the, the more important question to help you understand is how, right? So how do we find out how? It's mechanics. All right, so before the move, what happened, Rajiv? 53% of Bitcoin was pulled off exchanges. The average hold time in cold storage is 16, 18 months. So by reducing supply available to trade by that quantity, a whiff of buying would push price higher. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> then we had 229 consecutive days of extreme fear sentiment. Uh, at some point, we have to be contrarians and go against that, right? Because that can't continue forever. Um, and you had a lot of the the uh, shorts covered at the end of the year for to close off their books. So you you literally had a a perfect opportunity for just even a modest rise. Um, then when it when momentum begets more momentum, the banking crisis, which is not even close to over and probably won't be for a couple more years that really kicked it into gear because even you know my phone which has investors from 15 years ago 
who hate crypto, even they're blowing me up going, oh my God, I got how much Bitcoin do I got to buy? How quickly can we put money in the fund? So I, I do think there was a psychological catalyst where we all know we can hold, hold gold, but that's expensive to keep. We can't have 5 million of it in our room safe. Um, and we don't want to have paper gold because what's the point of that? So mm -hmm. what, what do we have to protect our, ourselves and our families? Bitcoin. And I'm not saying one's better or worse. I'm saying those are protective systemic hedges, period. So Got the it. combination of those, you get this ferocious rally. Okay. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, <clears throat> I, I suppose one of the interesting things that has held up this entire space is really the sense of uh, how do I put it? Religiosity and tribalness. That, that sort of, you know, these tokens sort of somehow seem to symbolize, right? Uh, folks that are in the space, particularly the serious ones, are extremely vociferous about the fact that this is the single biggest thing. There is no such thing called sliced bread as far as they are concerned, right? Hmm. There's nothing else except this, right? <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? So, um, and of course, there is also this argument of this, um, you know, which one is going to rule the roost? The one ring to rule them all, if I were to use the Lord of the Rings analogy kind of a thing, right? So, hmm. I mean, obviously, the positive positive part about the the passion comes out in this ecosystem unlike in the traditional asset classes where i mean i i don't see anybody getting passionate about holding a couple of mega cap stocks or you know some real estate somewhere right or, or even gold right if you know what i mean maybe rick rule is an example or an exception there but if you know what i mean but so the question really here is you know what is the what is the implication of this tribalness of and the religiosity in this space and what do you think is a so how has that driven behavior change in this ecosystem? Is it accelerating? Is it reducing? Is it pissing people off? Where do you sort of say, see this uh, going? So there's been iterations, right? E even in its in its 12-year history, Bitcoin's cyclical attributes have, have changed, right? And I'm a huge student of sacred geometry, so you can see this in the fractals and how they subdivide. Um, this year beginning is a totally new series for it. It's, it's, it's really, really cool to, to watch because price is actually the recording of human psych psychology, mm -hmm. liquidity real time. So it's a fascinating thing. Um, I would say what, where we sit today as a space is completely different from, let's say, 2021. Um, in 2021, you did have the religiosity of factions, right? And I, I would rather it be even though I admire passion, commitment, and and work ethic, I would rather it be spirituality than religiosity because that's that's reli religiosity is more power from above, um, and, and you get caught in your you know lane of faith based on whatever reasonings. But um, here we we sit where the space was very humbled. The good actors are still here and are obviously very ticked off that they've suffered. I mean, our, our team has PS, PTSD and we we hedged, the, hedged both sides and lived to fight another day, but it still was traumatic to have to go to multiple different exchanges. Then, then two solvent banks got shut down for no reason. We luckily have redundancies, but all of that stuff that, that has left the remaining participants more motivated than they've ever been before. And I think it synchronized everybody's maybe mantra, if you will, to say, look, we either go decentralized and the the public and investors at large, they get to select what's successful or we're just going to sign up for our CBDC. So I before it was I was super critical of the really immature factions arguing and, you know, looking like children. You know, I, my red shovel is better than your blue axe. You know, it, was, it was kind of pathetic, but there won't be one ring to rule them all. They're all different. And I break it up by sectors and I can kind of get into the taxonomy of how we classify and the sub the subsectors of crypto, if, if you'd like. Please do. I would love to know more about how you look mm -hmm. at the uh, asset classes within crypto. Absolutely. So you can do it basically by type of, of chain, proof of work or proof of stake. Proof of work, we're down to you know five or six assets, and that includes Bitcoin and Monero. Proof of stake is the majority of the L1s and there's different flavors of a delegated proof of stake, yada, yada, yada. Um, our preference is for permissionless open source networks. And there are some L1s that are not there yet. And mm -hmm. it's a transition from testnet to mainnet as they make the network perm permissionless. But in order for me to invest in it or use it, it must be permissionless. So 
that that we don't want to have any human oversight or element inputted into the chain or the activity on chain um, mm -hmm. with any of these assets. Layer twos are an interesting nuance because they, they're basically just to make the layer one interoperable across multiple chains, for example, and that like these zero knowledge proofs, which basically use a, a script to say, I'm right, you're right, well, let's go and keep everything to the side. It bashes the transactions for faster uh, finality. So you have to kind of break apart. Am I building on top of something, L1? Am I transacting or making another L1 better? And then am I storing energy and storing value? Um, or am I the, uh, a interface to buy metaverse real estate? So there's there's different categories. DeFi, for example, is kind of a catch-all, right? Mm -hmm. You say DeFi. Well, is that to me, that's Uniswap, Aave, Compound, Sushi Swap, basically the decentralized versions of traditional marketplaces. Um, but any any network you participate in that's open source and permissionless is technically DeFi. Mm -hmm. uh, alongside this, you know, obviously there is this question of how does the regulator treat this as a class, right? You know, I think that's a question that has been asked a little bit. Um, historically, it has sort of vacillated between a commodity versus a security, right? And uh, you obviously have the multiple tests that sort of, you know, meet this. Where do you sort of see this debate moving, you know, given where we are at this point in time? I, I think the assets themselves without question are commodities right and ethereum and bitcoin are ruled commodities in the united states cftc has jurisdiction i think where i could see how some met the howie test three prong howie test that's an old orange juice uh case in florida is the issuance of the tokens themselves and how the DAOs maintain those so if, what, one thing I don't like um, is if the foundation has, let's say, more than 15% of the tokens still in their holdings, that mm -hmm. that's creates kind of insider conditions similar to equities, whereas Ethereum is the only asset on earth where 100% of its tokens exist now, and it is deflationary. So I prefer that scenario than, you know, a foundation holding tokens. Are they staking them? And are they going to liquidate those kind of things and how it was issued could be construed securities because it's really the investment contract part of this that it lies on, not on what the asset is. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that clarified it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's shift gears a little bit now. We want to talk about um, how do you become a great trader in this ecosystem? Um, you have successfully made a transition from your traditional FI, TradFi, to being a quant trader, which itself is, I think, um, you know, the screaming end of TradFi, HFT and all that, um, you know, very exciting, glamorous stuff. And now obviously crypto quant, right? You know, what has this um, journey been like this? You know, how much have you been able to sort of bring in all your skills from that world into this world? What would what would you want to tell the tell us um, Luddites out here? Um, it's been real fun um, for us because a, a lot of math type folks and traders are, like masochists, they like pain and like challenges and um, like obstacles that we need to overcome. So the the first one, Rajiv, was really the tech interfaces, whether it's UX or UI for trading. Um, I don't know how long you've been an investor in, in Bitcoin or, or crypto in general, but even through 2019, the way we traded in stocks, futures, options with, you know, sophisticated out algorithms, co-location, so you're closer and tie, blah, 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 all that arms race stuff was not applicable because you were on like an HTML page on a REST API. Um, so we had all of this tech apparatus and all these strategy logics that we intended to immediately put to use. And then here we are doing what, creating what's called a, a gray box interface that's just analyzing data we think matters and then button pushing to then trade to a specific exchange so it was really really fun honestly because i hadn't traded that active on a desk since i was at morgan stanley um so it was super fun from that perspective and by participating daily in it 24 7 and whether it was the kimchi premium or it was these new exchange uh, listing tokens all over the world it really gave us a good purview of trying to make sure we're evolving with the different iterations of the space itself 
and the tech for trading. It's never, ever going to be one NYSE or NASDAQ. It's never going to be like that. So trying to curve fit everything to how we all know equities, where each country has one or two exchanges, it's not going to be like that. So we have to, okay, if it's not going to be like what we were used to, what do we have to design to risk manage and make sure our alpha concepts are expressed in the way that we want them to? Um, so it was a super awesome experience. You know, I, I wrote tickets back in the day in 2007 where, that you'd run a compliance. So it was, it, it was a little bit nostalgic. The key distinction, um, I think, is something I like to uh, uh, highlight because a lot of people don't disclose all the facts. The reality of both investors looking at price action that's only 10, 12 years long and a quant, I cannot run specific types of models. I cannot use the level of sophistication of machine learning that we, we did in the past purely without having enough data. And, and then building the archive, collecting the data, that was a whole nother ball game where, you know, we had a separate um, software firm called uh, OmniX that was an order management execution management system that was designed purely to tackle this. And it, it got purchased by Gemini last year. And the amount of servers we use and take up is absolutely insane, way more than the stock market. Got it, got it. So um, uh, let me let me ask another question around this. Uh, uh, so you've spoken about strategy diversification versus asset class diversification in uh, some of your conversations in the past, right? So can you talk a little bit about what that um, what that signifies? How would one look at it? Because you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to having a portfolio and having a viewpoint on what asset classes and how you know, how you're going to talk about that, right? So if you could sort of give us a little bit more some of a sense of what's happening there. So I missed the very first part of that word. Asset diversification versus uh, strategy diversification. Right. So that asset diversification is one layer. If you're solving for a diversified portfolio and you take the asset classes, beta, alpha, standard deviation, volatility, et cetera, at whatever time periodicity makes sense for how you're going to analyze the portfolio and to get an aggregate number. I, that's one way of doing things, but I and my team like strategy diversification because you can implement non-correlated strategies in one asset class and get a smoother, perhaps better risk-adjusted return over time. Um, so there's a big difference between I'm I'm going to trade contrarian. That's a that's a trading strategy. Uh, well, what are you going to trade contra contrarian? You can trade anything contrarian versus I'm just going to have reads as as a part of my portfolio right it's that's almost like an allocation that strategy less right that doesn't have one um and i think it's more important to understand the mechanics behind what strategies you like you can withstand and you understand because that keeps you from blowing up your portfolio got it got it okay so um, um, I think the next question, perhaps you've answered a part of this, but I want you to expound a little bit more on this, Chris. You um, you have a lot of quant trading in your um, in your heart and soul and mind. You've done a lot of this yourself. You understand technicals, you understand trends, you understand concepts and ideas. Obviously, a lot of that is applicable in the chat five space as well. Are these equally applicable in the digital um, asset space? Perhaps one question I would have, which is a you know commonsensical question, is the data sets for these assets in the chat five space are decades old, right? Whereas you know, in the digital space, you might have maybe maybe a few quarters of data, maybe maybe a couple of years of data. So, you know, are they applicable? Are you able to sort of extrapolate the trends that you would have gotten in the TradFi space into this world? I mean, how do you see that? It It's not easy, but you have to, luckily we began with a giant archive of strategies, whether, you know, my partner Heim had a zillion HFT market making strategies. I had a bunch of vol systematic and quant my partners, Kamel and Rishi, had Statar, Market Neutral, um, Risk Parity, all, all different styles of alpha concepts. So we had all of those factors archived and were able to test and regress them against the data uh, for crypto. Now, the duration of the data for crypto can't give you a 90% forward prediction right, a range. But if it's 59 to 75, is that good enough for rock and roll to try? And then our process is keep... The, the signal logic down to you know less than 10 inputs or factors 
um, we put our capital to work. We try and isolate it to maybe one exchange on a couple of tokens. And if it has the win loss ratio, the sharp ratio, what we're looking for over a 60, 90 day period, then, then it gets in queue to be launched in the fund. And there are th certain methods of trading that are inappropriate for crypto now that may be appropriate later. For example, like HFT, yeah, we can trade, we trade at one minute intervals, but that's not really high frequency trading, right? Um, a lot of that has to do with, there's just not a big offer on crypto a lot of times because the people who own it currently are not selling anytime soon. So the amount that's liquid on, on an ask constantly is a lot lower than we would, you know, design a strategy to run a hundred million in, for example. Got it. Got it. So um, I think the next question has to do with, um, uh, you know, so the, the stable coins per se. So um, whilst um, the true native cryptos like Bitcoin, et cetera, still rule the roost, there seems to be a lot of holding in stable coins, perhaps because the volatility in those is a little lesser. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, isn't there an inherent contradiction here? So, you know, the idea was to sort of, you know, move away from the fiat ecosystem into this uh, new asset class that was entirely transparent and on chain. Um, and uh, it seems to me that even in that world, there seems to be so much of holding in, you know, what looks like, um, you know, digital equivalent of the fiat, right? So, you know, what's your what's your uh, thought here? Yeah, it's almost, in some ways, it's almost worse than fiat, right? Um, I, you, you know, I, I look at both sides of it, right? How is it better than fiat? Oh, well, tethers on Tron's blockchain layer one, you know, so that's better than it sitting at Goldman who got fined a zillion dollars yesterday for lying about 60 million shorts that they, they report as long. So, you know, you know, you can't trust entities like that. This is better and it's more transparent, but at the same time, there, there are what we call Euro dollar deposits, dollar denominated deposits outside the United States in institutions that are not always disclosed. The updates are vague at best. And really there's no point in it because it also perpetuates the, the fiat in addition to doing that. So to me, it's antithetical. Why, why it was built primarily is to make the trading more comparable to equities where you had an out from the volatility of the underlying asset. When I started investing in this, it was we sent Bitcoin everywhere and then rolled into other assets and Bitcoin is a stable coin. Um, so I, I, and I know why the regulators hate them because they're Euro dollar deposits that they can't control. So it's like these, these are pissing off the OG, you know, advocates for decentralization like me, as well as uh, Gary Gensler and the Fed. So <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to see him go away, but again, let the market decide. Like I, I won't put my capital in it or my investor's capital, but if someone wants to use it, by all means. <laughs> Absolutely. Whilst on this, and I, I think, um, uh, Chris, I'm going to draw you out because I sort of know what your point of view is on this one. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about the CBDCs, right? So clearly Chinese have come out. Uh, we in India are talking about it. I was just with the banker today and he was telling me, yes, we are rolling this out. I asked him, you know, why are you doing it? I mean, it sounds like this is not going to be very good for the banking ecosystem itself in general. So why are you doing it? But anyway, so that's a conversation. And of course, um, you know, uh, Jerome Powell himself is considering it. So <clears throat> Your thought process on CBDC, what do you think of what should be the point of view we should have? Uh, as an investor, as a human, or both? <laughs> Your call, maybe both. <laughs> um, well, let, let's, let's diagnose how this came about and why it's coming to head now. The existing system has been bankrupt since 2001. Plain and simple. We have four point something quadrillion credit derivatives. We have, you know, 200 trillion in, in outstanding liabilities in the United States, 35 trillion of absolute debt. China's a 200 trillion of debt. Like the system is already dead. And before it shows us all in our faces, like it started to now, they want to have an out that gives them even more control than they already have without having to recognize that oh, you know what? We're the smartest people in the universe and we're supposed to be for you and you know, price stability and full employment. But guess what? Uh, we just stole wealth from all of the labor on the planet in the last 40 years. So it is first an attempt to cover and disguise the eroding and collapse of the old system. 
That's number one. That's why. And then as a result of people's compliance during the COVID lockdowns, that accelerated this plan. And so, oh, well, people will, they'll stay in their house all day, even though nobody's getting sick. You know, they were like, they got so excited. And then you got the great reset with that, right? Now it's pulled forward maybe sooner than the tech would be ready to run if I were doing it because of the, you know, desperation that the entire banking system is facing here. So, you know, that that's the appraisal of the situation. My, my opinion of it is I will never participate in that system. No, neither will my family. I'd rather live on an island fishing and eating coconuts than kowtow to the empire and be given empire credits. Like, I'm not doing it. You're not allowed the force to say, I to strike back and may the force be with you, right? <laughs> <But> <laughs> Using again, some Star Wars um, analogies here. Just like the globalization and over-financialization mm -hmm. movement, what did that do? It isolated manufacturing pockets to places of exploit, and, and India knows this very, very well, so that the, the companies in America or Europe or wherever aren't responsible. The people that buy the products don't see the leach fields for two miles of li you know, lithium mines, right? And went, Whoa, I thought it was environmentally friendly. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that plus we're going to eliminate every small business. There will not be mom and pops that are the bedrock of communities all over the planet. And that it really is, you know, spiritual and psychological. They want to break relationships and bonds between human be beings in ways that we've not seen before. And the CBDC will will literally be the end game of that. Wow, that's a very strong point of view. But let me let me ask you this question, Chris. So there is this prevalent thinking in the mainstream world, right? That um, the big boys of regulation actually keep them safe, right? You know, the Fed governments still provide quite a bit of protection. For instance, deposits were protected during the SVB crisis. You know, the entire Fed put story, which sort of keeps the mainstream market mm -hmm. sort of, you know, continuing to take more and more risk, as it were, you know, um, you know, obviously the regulatory recourse, the reporting, the oversight, the fact that SEC will get after somebody and, you know, sort of put them into jail if something happens, etc. Right. Whereas, you know, there seems to be this some um, thinking that the crypto world is a bit of the wild, wild west. You know, you've got a bunch of people sitting in the Bahamas or whatever else and, you know, sort of, you know, cooking up some stuff. God knows what they're doing. Right. Kind of this. I mean, what would you say to those folks that sort of say, well, actually, the traditional world seems to be safer because clearly what you said just now was actually the reverse of uh, what you how do you how do you sort of reconcile the two points of view? Well, one of them is wrong. <laughs> mathematically, mathematically, philosophically, and spiritually, um, what we are all used to can can we all admit it, it's not it's not working? Like you just said, were the SVB deposits secured? No, they were fucking gone, and then they got bailed out. And somehow Jenny Yellen says, "Oh, the taxpayer didn't pay for it. Well, where'd the money come from? They didn't monetize bonds to support it. Where'd the money come from? I mean, so having a system." that doesn't work, that we're forced to trust, that's not merit-based, that doesn't do anything good for anybody, right? It's not on the merits of the value creation of the system itself. Not only are we defrauded, but we have to also believe. And you know, we can't believe because you just said Fed put, that's exactly why it still exists. So you're going to tell me to walk in to B of A and put all my family's assets into a bank I know is bankrupt? No way. It's illogical. So one viewpoint is incorrect. At the same time, Wild West is is not the right analogy because there's not like, you know, nerdy blockchain developers fighting in saloons and stuff. It's it's just new and unfamiliar, but not to me and uh, one million others that hold greater than one Bitcoin, which we just surpassed yesterday. So it, it's just experience. Like in, in, in any sector, I'm not going to know anything about orthopedics, right? It'll look like the Wild West to me, but I know there's 25 companies that make fake knees. So it's, there's similar corollaries everywhere. We're mm -hmm. sort of coming to the, you know, sort of the penultimate couple of questions, uh, Chris. But one question I had was, see, you are... 
your past background is that you were a wall trader and wall is obviously a very, very difficult space. You know, as it is, people find it difficult to understand equities and follow what's happening there. Wall is like a second order derivative of that calculus and all the jazz that has to go in there, right? You know, so clearly that's something that you've sort of, you know, you know, sort of created a clear viewpoint out of. And this, this is an asset that has got insanely high wall, right? You know, it used to be, I think, what, 100 plus wall earlier. Now it's what, 50 to 90. That's what you said, at least. So, you know, obviously wall has got a huge behavior implication in terms of how you know how people look at it right because high wall essentially means that i get into a trade right now in the next um, you know five minutes i could either end up being, being wiped out or become a millionaire right you know you know obviously that's a bit of an exaggeration but you sort of know where i'm getting mm -hmm. at with this so i mean what does that high wall mean to this asset class right and is it you know obviously the traditional world has gone lower wall as well right? you know you know 2017 was, I think, you know, we got to almost uh, the equivalent of zero wall with maybe 10 wall or whatever that we got to. So, I mean, what do you see as this dichotomy in the two walls and what do you think is driving it one? And what is the behavioral change because of this high wall, right? If you could sort of, you know, uh, get a little deeper into this, because this is an area of expertise too. So if you could right. please take as much time as you want to talk about. Yeah, th this. thanks for um, even giving me the, the floor here, because this is something that um, I, I can unpack in a, in a level of detail that others who don't trade options or vol can um let me first say with with the realized volatility calculation like 50 or 90 or 180 right in equities that usually transposes to options and in most recently in the last two years options have actually been wagging the tail and the uh, the gamma and vega and deltas in the options market are actually pulling price one way or the other in in the model that everybody uses in the traditional space is called black shoals and in crypto the majority of the options are traded otc or over the counter which means you and i actually bid and ask on on what we should trade so the greeks whether it's theta rho vega gamma etc are almost not applicable and not correlate directly to realized fall in mm -hmm. crypto so it's, it's a very interesting um new options market which is very similar to when options on commodities started right? Because you had a cash settle option on a in-kind settled future, right? So it's that that's, that's our comp um, circa late fifties into seventies. And the expression of the options now leading the stock market is not going to transpose into crypto. The options market's not big enough. The Greeks are not, you know, rock solid. So you can't run very sophisticated uh, models, especially using leverage. So the vol strategies we do are very simplistic, not too many legs, not too far out in duration. And then you're also taking, um, hopefully, you know, the right kind of counterparty risk if you're trading a swap over the counter. Uh, mm -hmm. We use, we actually still use the ISDA contracts for registered swap dealers. Uh, we are QIB, so uh, we can we can issue those. Uh, but it's funny that the regulation for credit derivatives and stock derivatives is the same one we're applying to to crypto mm -hmm. um but to speak to volatility you know why, why don't i ask you back how, how did equity vol drop so much from 2013 to to now i know you gave me the answer yesterday mm -hmm. so maybe uh, it's not a, it's not a it's not a great answer but i mean i i guess it has a lot to do with the fact that see wall falls when certainty rises right so i think that's a that's a simple argument that's to be made and in some senses thanks to the fed the behavior and other behaviors zero interest rate regimes the fed put etc there has been a high amount of certainty in terms of how behavior has been driven, because of which obviously everybody knows that the market is going in one direction and one direction only, which I think is the reason why I think the, the challenges, you know, perhaps, and that would be my answer, but uh, I would want you to yeah. expound a bit more on that, Chris. I, I think that's a good surface level, but we, we also need to separate vol of the S&P is not the same as VIX, right? So when you're speaking of uncertainty, the VIX prices that uncertainty because people are willing to pay more for puts. Mm -hmm. That's how the VIX goes up. But that doesn't mean the correlated percentage differential in that is the realized vol at one day or 10 day level of the S&P. So those being wholly different, I think, is uh, evident of a market that doesn't fun function properly, number one. But, you know, to me, how they would re relate to digital assets, you're going to naturally have more vol 
when price can do what it wants. Like this is a pure price discovery market that's also 24 seven. And you're, you don't have the mechanisms to force direction one way or the other based on news, Fed put, uncertainty, et cetera. Those are actually not how the, the high realized ball is priced in, in crypto. It's, it's more because the market's completely free. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a that's a second order nuance. I think which I think uh, helps quite a bit. Well, I, I think it has been a fabulous conversation so far, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. If there is a way for people to reach you, where would they come to? You know, uh, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about where they can find you? Sure, our website's hyperiondecimus.com. That's H Y P E R I O N D E C I M U S. There's a kind of contact us page that routes to our operations team. Um, we're pretty absent from social media, except for LinkedIn. That's purposeful. We're super private people. Uh, the investors we represent are also uh, in that in that vein. Um, but generally, we're we're available to take questions, answer calls, help people really try and understand the space. Because if if you don't feel it's right for you as an investor, then you shouldn't do it. Like the whole point of a role that we have is not to provide returns; it's to provide peace of mind. Returns come when you do that first. Um, so that, that's what I'd advocate for. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate the time. Um, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Um, I have at least a couple of startups that will be very excited about talking to you. So we'll make sure that we get to that conversation as well. But uh, in the meantime, um, have a great day. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again in the next few months um, You know, to talk about the rise and rise of the crypto world. Aim into that. <laughs> well, thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.